camera switched off uh, uh, at the moment because uh, it's not uh, it didn't allow me to too many tabs open and <laughs> things like that but anyways um what's important is that you can see the screen if there's any echo problems in the house or in the hair when i'm in this room please do let me know i'll try and speak softer because <laughs> i can hear some echo already um okay anyways um let's maybe make a start so thank you all for for joining me today uh, in one of our tech thursday events um usually happens at the end of the um the month but uh, there was some problems with registration i understand last time so we we planned it today uh does Lucinda or Edith want to come in and, and say anything before me or or am, am, am I good to go? I think you're good to go. Excellent. Um, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take that as a as I'm good to go. Okay, so so as you know, my name is Manish Malik. At that time when I when I was doing this research, I was a PhD student uh, with the Lancaster University. Uh, since then, obviously, I have completed it. Um, but um, this has been a long time coming I mean, uh, for me. Uh, I've been in the higher education sector for more than um, 19 years, um, and uh, this was some uh, something that I always wanted to to, to investigate uh, in a, in a greater detail. So I began maybe like six years ago, and part time alongside my job. Um, yeah, I enrolled on this wonderful. Uh, e-research program uh, in the Department of Education Research in Lancaster. But um, yeah, and then, so uh, in the meantime, when I was developing lots of software for teaching and learning uh, applications for my own use and the use of other people in my department, in my university. Um, so I just thought you know, it'd be a good idea to to investigate uh, one of the softwares that I made uh, in, in greater detail. So for those of you who are interested in uh, orchestration, this is a term uh, used by Pierre Dillenberg and many other researchers. Um, and that's to uh, give an action that almost all teachers do in classrooms. They they manage the, the, the teaching time and, and the different activities that students are required to take part in. So now, uh, what, what I thought of, if, if, if all of that can be done through technology, then what what will happen? So that was my question in my mind. Will it have any benefits for the students? It may have benefits for staff because then they are free to do other things. Um, but are there any actual benefits for students? Because the reason we are going to do things differently is primarily for the benefit of students. So I thought, okay, let's not only investigate um, the effect of this for the non, um, for, for, for the average student, but also bring in a little bit of um, angle of, of uh, disability in it. Because if you have te if you have technology, it may have benefits uh, for people with disabilities. So I set out to look for um, developing uh, team working skills, things like trust, self-efficacy, communication, and so on, uh, co-regulation skills and so on, between teammates who are a mix of neurotypical and neuroatypical. So people who are neuroatypical are people who have autism, ADHD, but to a level where where you know they they can be successful in 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 higher education, but they they have special needs. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll highlight the problem statement itself, um, what, some motivation for doing the research and so on, and intervention details, research design, findings and conclusion in that order. Because um, I've been teaching in the engineering. Um, academic sort of domain for the last 19 years and we've seen courses go from non-PBL to PBL and back to non-PBL in some cases and I know from first hand that there are some problems associated with project-based learning, problem-based learning 
um, we use them, um, but we then have some unsolved uh, situations. Likewise, uh, I mean, flip, flip classroom is very popular across the sector and in engineering as well. People do use it, but we often face that question of will the students come prepared to the class? And if they don't, how do you then use the, you know, the, the, the skills and knowledge that students have? Um, what was the best approach there? So I thought both of these are collaborative approaches. If I uh, apply the technology that I have built in these settings, I might find some interesting results. Um, in particular around the area of developing skills and attitudes for team working because both have an element of collaboration involved. Uh, because if you ask students to learn things outside the class in flipped classroom, inside the class they're doing some collaborative stuff. In project-based learning, in teams they are working on projects. So, so they require these skills. And going back to that problem of uh, you know, flipping in and out of these things, these approaches, um, often staff will find and students will complain that these approaches require a greater socio-cognitive uh, you know, involvement, demands from, from them and, and so on. And not everybody is, is good with team working in, in the very first uh, attempt at it. Um, some people are, some are not. So it could end up um, in a ineffective, inefficient, sort of even non-inclusive. If, if people have uh, socio-cognitive disorders, then it's very hard for them to fully uh, benefit from from team working. Although exposing, I believe, exposing uh, more uh, team working scenarios to to everyone is is generally of benefit benefits for for all people. Um, so so with that in in mind. <clears throat> that we don't really have a, a, a set way to, to run these um, techniques, uh, approaches, and, uh, and benefit everybody equally. I thought, okay, um, how, how, what, what do we already know and, and, and about team working and what, do we, what can we further investigate? Um, so I came across the literature, huge literature on team effectiveness, and it, it kind of links team effectiveness to multiple things. Uh, one of them is trust between teammates, which is a term which is quite often found in um, industrial organization psychology literature. Um, however, it's hardly studied in um, educational studies because it takes a long time to build the trust by the time it takes, uh, you know, seven or eight weeks to, to build that trust between teammates. Most semesters are, are nearly to the end. And so I guess uh, there's la lack of study because of that reason um, that people think, okay, by the time it will be, uh, you, you'll figure out something about trust, it will be probably already be too late. So we have to find some other ways of, of making teams effective. But in the industry, this is an important area. You know. So I thought if we can, speed up the buildup of trust through technology because as technology often does it does things more sometimes more efficiently sometimes more uh, usefully for some people and so on so i thought maybe maybe there's something there so how can we develop trust within educational settings and how can we do it with technology so that was one of my uh, areas then the other thing i uh, found in the effectiveness literature, team effectiveness literature, was to do with conflict management. Uh, students or people with better conflict management skills uh, results in better effective teams. So I thought maybe that's not so much um, often of a problem within educational teams because you know people don't end up pulling out each other's hairs and <laughs> hair and. Uh, over, over matters, but then I thought, oh, maybe sometimes about about marks. There are quarrels in the in the educational teams and student teams. They can be very vocal about who gets what. Um, so maybe there are some some reasons to study that. Uh, but then again, there was a, a huge piece of literature around technology enhanced uh, team 
uh, orchestration and that, therein I found references to self-co and socially shared regulation skills. Now I'll elaborate on these a bit later, but uh, these are um, starting from from self. Is it's about more about how a person is uh, keeping themselves motivated and and engaged with the learning and with the team working, how they're able to uh, support one other member. So that's co-regulation, and how they are able to together regulate each other as a team. So that's socially shared regulation. Um, uh, in order to achieve the goals of, of whatever it is that you're doing in your project-based learning or flipped classroom you know, as, as a team, whatever it is, so, so, so that everybody can pull together towards one simple goal and so on to make the team effective. So this was the model that I, I, that I found. And, and, and so again, I wanted to study uh, people with neuroatypical and neurotypical uh, categories within those categories. And I thought, let's just dwell a little bit more on that and found out that, you know, autistic students, they, they struggle with building the trust. Um, they could be either under or over trusting, you know, of, of other people and that might end, uh, and not end always in a happy place for them. Um, and equally, trusting people who are autistic could also be difficult for non-autistic people because of the maybe behavioral or um, the lack of social uh, skills perhaps or communication issues, whatever it need, is needed to build the trust is it can hamper uh, on both sides. So there's, so I found that there's some sort of evidence about that in the literature, uh, but never been studied within all our uh, educational teams. So I thought, okay, well, that's something to look out for as well in my study. Um, and again, regarding conflict, autistic uh, students or people uh, with autism may be um, prone to avoid conflict altogether because that, uh, it, from their past experiences with it, it is not a pleasant experience. So they, instead of trying to resolve, they might be wanting to avoid. So they might have a preference towards avoiding, which could also be a problem um, in teams. And there is some evidence that autistic students uh, or people will not engage in regulating other people because that could be, they're not comfortable with that um, particular uh, form of regulation. So one other person may be fine with, with team, but not so much uh, at a one-to-one -one level. <clears throat> Likewise, often with ASD comes uh, ADHD uh, as a comorbid condition and um, and, and that uh, can also have implications on team working because people with ADHD may prefer a certain structure, a certain way of working to keep them focused and keep them uh, yeah, involved in that kind of blocks the communication perhaps with other people around them. Now I'm, I'm making some sweeping statements here, but I think what I'm, what I'm, I, I kind of find similarities to those statements in my data. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay to, uh, be, to make those statements uh, um, because my data was kind of saying that as well. Um, anyways, um, and in terms of uh, within institutions, uh, support for neuroatypical students tend to be in the form of reasonable adjustments or training just for them uh, students separately for whatever reasons you know the institutions tend to provide that kind of support now um, I thought maybe if, if people are put together and the orchestration is done by technology and it's very effective then perhaps we don't need to have the extra non-contextual training because people need to learn to work with each other first and then we have, when they have that skill, then they can maybe transfer it to other people. And it's always very difficult for people who are autistic to, um, or to, to, to form that bond with some new people all of a sudden. So if you're getting training about team working in a different environment and you're working in a different environment, that kind of didn't sit well with me. So I thought there should be something which, which allows the training together. 
uh, while you while you while you're working in the team and that's what what i wanted to to um, see if, if there is any solution there so yeah so so the idea was to in include people in team working rather than have them separately undergo trainings so this is the the intervention that i came up with i uh, over maybe two years uh, developed different versions of coggle uh, which is a computer orchestrated group learning environment and uh, it basically uses things like uh, you know you, you may have heard of mastery which is used in khan academy and other many other uh, online systems where people are doing uh, learning on their own but they have to attempt let's say 10 questions eight questions seven questions whatever it is to master a particular topic and then they move on to the next step and then and branch off into different topics and so on but in this case, my my environment is a group environment, so I wanted to orchestrate the whole group towards mastery. So I thought, okay, we'll build something which extends the mastery concept to the whole group. Um, and to do so, we use multiple choice questions, which kind of is Eric Mazur's um, peer instruction style of um, peers teaching each other, helping each other. So the whole group was kind of orchestrated to talk to each other at different points based on their answers and so on. So, so there's a bit of that in, in the system. Um, and also uh, there is uh, some prompting and messaging from the system itself to, to, to help uh, students um, watch a video to, that helps basically understand a, a topic which, which, um, which is not quite understood by the group. And that comes from um skills sort of question designs and options chosen in, in a particular way that highlight a cognitive conflict and and if two options are um there which is which is causing a cognitive conflict it's easy to then resolve that cognitive conflict by playing a video that is related to that cognitive conflict and so, so all of that is there in the system um and by repeated sort of messaging from the system in the textual domain, the messages that the screen plays out to students to do certain things, to become better, to become, uh, to master the topic as a group, basically um, can help internalizing good team working skills. And so that was the, the idea behind it. Things like uh, externalizing what to do when you're in a difficulty, you know, always saying things like oh teamwork is is dream work that kind of motivational things metacognitive skills around team working those messages are there in the system and they play out at different situations and so on so not only that uh, the system also gives you an indication of how the team is performing who are the strong students who need a little bit of you know support and so on within the group and after a little while, when you, when, when this, this system's been used, these kind of messages are are shown to students, so they can they can look out and 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 start to work as a team and develop people um, in in the team as they go along, and as they chase this goal of group wide mastery, if you like. So I do have a video. I don't know whether that will function. Any feedback will be better. Um, I don't know if you can see the video. So this is how a student will, will go into a room and then they'll wait for their other friends to join the same room. So this is all in front of one computer, three people sitting in front of a computer, four people sitting in front of a computer. With their mobile phones, they can log in, but they're looking at one screen. And that screen is uh, in front of us at the minute. And these are... Um, Okay, they, we'll talk about these four squares in a minute. So these are people coming in into the into the room together to learn. Then they watch a video on a topic together on one screen. So they're not watching it separately; they're watching together. Uh, so building that community feel. And then they are asked uh, ten questions, twelve questions, one after the other, and they all have to using these keypad look at the question options on the screen and then go for a b c d individually each team member does that and then all of them have answered 
it goes and says, yeah, that, that's a great answer. Well done, mastering together, master this together, teamwork pays. Those are the kind of prompts I was saying earlier. So that's how the system continues to um, orchestrate team working by um, allowing people to join into one screen and, and read the prompts and take the quiz together rather than doing it individually, separately. So this is the whole group when they reach to a stage when they're halfway through the cycle, halfway through the round, the system will show them a team performance um, graph which will come in a minute. Maybe I can skip that a bit. Uh, I don't want to skip it too much. Uh, okay, so here somebody got a question wrong. And as you can see, their progress has been resetted. And uh, the, the two people have been uh, put together to, to talk to each other. So these are these, the orchestration is like this. So the machine tells who talks to who and when. And uh, now they begin all over again to to the, to the journey of mastery, are you getting 10 questions correct in a row? Um, you can set it to six if, if you do too, too frustrating for students, but yes, yeah, it can be frustrating. But that's the important bit that that frustration because of having to do more question pulls them together as well, gets them going as a, as a team. Anyways, you saw a graph a, a few seconds ago, that graph shows your progress and it should be really a, a steep green line, but there, if they are red, phases in between means people have made mistakes and so on. And they can even choose who they want to uh, explain um, uh, a particular question if they have a preferred person and so on. So there are many features in there. Students don't often use all the features, but they are in there if, if somebody wanted to, to use. And that's how it keeps going. Um, and at some stage it will say, well done to the team that they have answered. So you can see the green green tracker on the top here. It's increasing every time a correct answer is, is made, but it goes back down if, if a mistake is made. So that pulls the teammates together, working towards the goal of group-wide mastery. And if they need help from the system, as you can see, there was a little video being played, then that is based on, on the weaknesses of that team at that moment in time. A particular video has been chosen by the system to, to improve the knowledge that this, the team seems to uh, not have at the minute. So the system is doing that in the background, some kind of calculations on that. Okay, so eventually uh, they go to that stage where they are able to uh, master. And that's the, that's it. That's one topic done, and then they can move on to the others, other topics. Okay. So yeah. So one of the findings in the in the in the study was these penalties of having to restart the count towards mastery um, was frustrating students, and and that would that would trigger some kind of emotive discussion between people. Uh, even bad, wrong behavior uh, in the system, but then the system to really get mastery, if they have to follow the scripts that are written into the, into the system. And many people, in fact, all of the teams were um, auto-correcting their, their poor behavior to really then come together to, towards that one goal of mastery. So the frustration was there, but it was helpful, like a kind of a positive frustration. So how do I um, evaluate the, the system? I created two, three different case studies, actually. One of them had these computer orchestrated learning sessions, learning together sessions. There were four of them in which they learned electronics related topics, um, which helped them then go and design in a student orchestrated um, working together session, some kind of flipped class activity, a flipped classroom activity where they would build a little circuit based on the knowledge that they have uh, captured in these sessions. So you can see, you can view this as, this is the outside bit, and this is the in-class bit of the flip classroom. Only that, what I'm enforcing now is I'm asking them to come inside the class without the teacher using the machine uh, and study on their own. So instead of flip, uh, flipping the room, classroom to home, I'm just saying you stay in the classroom, but the flip is that the teacher is not there, the machine is there. Uh, and here again, they can be with the teacher, but in, in the study for the purposes of the study, I just didn't uh, play any part as a teacher there. I was an observer. 
So here it's completely student orchestrated. There's no teacher whatsoever in, in the whole activity. Then again, I wanted to repeat that, but for a slightly longer period to see what happens there. Um, and this was completely accidental. I didn't know what will happen. I just designed four, four sessions worth of content for the flip classroom. And I thought, okay, if they want to do a little bit bigger project, they need a little bit more. So I added three extra old sessions in which they learned a bit, a bit more advanced topics. So they could design not only a filter, but also an amplifier, that kind of thing. So in the, in the project, they did the, this, this group, this arm of the study did the full filter and an and amplifier, this arm of the study did only the filter. Um, and you'll see that their levels of students that came into the, into the, into the study were also from uh, different groups. So one of them was foundation year, and then this one was the first year of electronic engineering. And then I wanted to repeat this in a case where uh, Coggle was not used. So we get an understanding or like a benchmark of what happens when the machine is not there, when the students are left to their devices on their own to work together for, you know, I could have chosen flipped classroom, but I thought, okay, let's use the the seven session one as a comparison, because I wanted to to study the long-term effect of, of, of this kind of work and see when the trust builds up in, uh, because it would probably not build up in four sessions. That was the theory that was the literature pointing out. Um, so I thought, okay, let's do it seven sessions, see if by seven sessions, what the literature says, the trust will come in. Well, does that come in? So I did, did it in this way. So these people, these students, they watched the same videos that I had in Coggle. They had the same questions, but just the orchestration was not there. The technology orchestration was not there. And uh, yeah, so so that's the, the structure of the study. And at different points, I took some measurements. I measured uh, not only trust related data, but also asked students to record daily key events. And so get a bit of qualitative as well as quantitative data on, on trust, on team working skills, on um, yeah, people, how they are feeling, how they're learning, that, that kind of uh, question is that I uh, either used some pre-existing ones or made my, my own ones. Um, for mainly for the qualitative and at the end of the the SWOT activities there were there were interviews you know qualitative interviews one hour long interviews for uh, neurotypical students and probably nearly 1.5 uh, to two hours for the neuroatypical um, because it takes longer to to discuss all the issues um, of, of uh, interest uh, in, in this. So that's uh, how I did. So there was a, if you want to use the, the technical terms, there was one theoretical replication over here. And then there was one uh, other, the analytical sort of replication here. Literal replication, sorry. Yeah. So this was a literal rep replication using Coggle here as well as here. But then try and see what happens when you don't have Coggle. Will the seven weeks be enough for, for them to become a team? Uh, as long as they use the same content, the same questions, and without the teacher. So that's what's the, the overall design. Okay. So different case uh, cases were, were investigated. And uh, yeah, I, I did some calculations on their scores of on a, on a pre-test and a post-test and used to use that to calculate the learning gain also did some uh, data and methodological triangulation from quantitative, qualitative across the cases, you know, that kind of um, data from after analyzing them using grounded theory-based thematic analysis, um, but also um, using uh, normal sort of bucket uh, themes to apply to the data that I already had. So, so I, I massaged the data from all different angles and to see where uh, what, what is it that I can glean from it? Um, yeah, so this was the overall uh, model. And now to the findings. In the first case, uh, where we had used Coggle in a flipped classroom setting, we had six students, which were then split into two teams. This was random teams. They didn't know, know each other. The first year into the foundation um, program. And uh, in the very first week, in the induction week, I picked them out of their 
comfort zones and say, Long, let's do this. Um, one of them declared as autistic, which was a self diagnosed rather than a proper diagnose, but they had a, a son who had been diagnosed. So it was their assumption that they might also be autistic, uh, but they never had a formal diagnosis, but they had lived with it for many, many years and uh, they suspected that they had. Um, anyway, so the, the age range was, as you can see from 18 to 54 um, in this case. And um, then I evaluated of, about the, um, how, how the Kaggle system affected people's uh, efficacy of the subject, self-efficacy uh, about the subject, and also uh, their self-regulation skills as to it, it, by working in this environment, does it make any difference to their uh, self-regulation capabilities? Uh, you can they plan, do, reflect, review that that sort of thing. Um, so the uh, pre and post test difference was significant. Um, the Wilcoxon sand sign rank test, um, and the learning gains, normalized learning gains, were all positive. One was small, but then the others were uh, more than 0.3. In terms of the qualitative themes that came from the grounded theory inspired thematic analysis, um, self-efficacy itself was, was one of the themes. People saying, now I know the subject, I'm feeling confident about it, um, having helped others or being helped by others, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so, so there were uh, two sources of qualitative data. One was the SSRL survey, the uh, socially shared regulation survey, in which six on six students, there were themes related to self-efficacy. In the interview data, however, there were four of them who were, were reiterating the, the fact that they, they were completely uh, confident about the, the subject. The other two, one of them was the autistic student and the other one was um, a neurotypical student. They just said that if we had more time, perhaps we would have learned even more. So it wasn't denying that they they, they, they learned anything, but they felt that it, by doing a little bit more, it would be more beneficial. Um, and also I evaluated uh, the work that they did. I either designed that filter, so I marked that based on their um, work. And both the teams uh, had a high score to support that they knew as a team, individually as well as a team, uh, the topics and they could design the filter that I had put, put in front of them. And these are foundation students that probably never, never ever designed a filter before. So within four sessions, they are able to do that with a high score. So that was um, good to see. In terms of trust, um, I can maybe pull up all the points and then talk about them, yeah. So in terms of quantitative results about trust, I use a survey that has been used elsewhere, been you know uh, uh, tested for validity and, and so on. And the statements that were there, um, they, they assessed three different types of trust. The effective trust, which is people happy to work together with each other. Cognitive trust, which is uh, people have trust in other people to know the subject. And cognitive trust is like somebody who will do what they say. They will be there when when the team is meeting in that kind of area. So statements would sort of capture those emotions, those feelings from the from the respondents. And as you can see at the start, even from in this 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 is the number of people who express trust in others in their team. So by by giving a, a Likert score of five or more. So five people, at the, even at the start of the very first day of the of the study, are saying, "Oh yeah, I, I trust. I like my uh, teammates. I'm a, I have effective trust in them." So that's what they were saying. They they think they could work with uh, all other people. Five of them out of the six, two of them didn't know. Uh, they said, "Yeah, they must be all good with their knowledge as well." But the other four, they reserved their their comments. They said, "Okay, we don't know yet. We'll we'll find out." And likewise, three said, yeah, yeah, they're reliable, but the other three reserved their comments and no, I don't know yet. So, so different people take different stances and this is kind of uh, reflective of that, that's good. But after the four sessions uh, on using Kaggle for, for two hours in each session, mastering the topics each time, 
this is what they they rated their teammates as so now from five to six people really liked each other to work so the effective trust is there and they have also now a better understanding of who knows what so cognitive trust is there one person not so um, and then the cognitive trust for having worked together for four sessions they, that kind of shot up as well um, because teammates were there mostly and there was one student out of one team in each team not there for one session but they could join remotely in the system that was the good thing about it so it was a hybrid system even before the pandemic uh, anyways so six people um yeah six five and six after four sessions just before the flipped classroom activity i measured again just to see whether that had changed that has any impact on it so so that kind of the same apart from one person going down on the cognitive trust that was perhaps due to one person coming in a bit late in 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 the in the flipped classroom activity session but anyways what is interesting is that then it dropped afterwards but that's uh, another uh, matter but we can talk about that um so trust was up in ASD student and ASD student uh, was uh, expressing from their past that they are they're over trusting and this kind of thing but they were able to correct that uh, and they were able to to trust uh, other people correctly like um, they were able to place the correct level of trust in in their teammates um, they weren't like they started off with very high scores of sevens for all of the all three aspects um, three three aspects of trust but then they came down from seven to to six to, to five in some cases but they still trusted the others because that was the case uh, as you can see in the in this data qualitatively uh, themes from both the interview and the and the survey um, are suggesting that Kaggle help build trust in many ways not just uh, it helps effective trust to grow, cognitive trust to grow, or cognitive trust to grow, and and even if these three are the categories, there are multiple ways that that these three can be can be enhanced. So, and and the same kind of findings were uh, reiterated in the one-to-one -one interviews that that I conducted. Of course, the activity was a success itself, so that could be a, a way to to reflect on the on the trust that that was there in the team. That oh, they worked fine, their scores were high, and there was no dispute and anything. Yeah. So that should be an indication that trust had built. Okay. So case two, I'll go a bit quicker because I've spent a lot of time explaining each each thing there. So again, similar things, similar results uh, from the self-efficacy. You can see in both the, the themes things uh, were, were dipping in and out of uh, confidence and, and trust as well uh, as the topics grew a little um, harder in, in in there but uh, coggle would step in and, and support the students as, as that would happen as well so that that's uh, helped the the themes to continue to work together for a longer extended period of time and this teams, the, the the teams here, they were like uh, three teams, two teams of three and and one team of four, and there were these sort of splits between uh, well, number of people who had ADHD or ASDs is, is shown here. The age range is shown there as well. So out of the three teams, uh, all of them had scores about 50, if I can recall, uh, 60, 50 something, 55, 56, and the the two teams, other two teams had. Uh, 70 and 80 something like that so very high score on on two and and good enough score on on one so nobody was like okay we can't do this but they did it and and um and so on trust wise again you can see they started off with high scores high number of people trusting each other effectively even cognitively without even knowing each other i don't know how that works but people just you know didn't want to say maybe but anyways after the, the there's a determinism there you can see after after the seven sessions nine people say we trust each other there was one who didn't um and then there were um, variations after seven sessions from oh sorry let me think yeah this is after four sessions yeah nine 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 is after four sessions and ten eight seven after seven sessions and just before the PJ, pjbl activity I measured it again to see what what is the state of things at that point. You can see that 10, 10, 9 people 
are saying that they trust each other. But it again also dropped off to the classroom activity. So I'll be a little quicker. It's, it's, it's a similar story uh, here. And in the third case, slightly different scenario where there's no Coggle, people are watching the videos, asking, answering the questions. The questions are the same. Then they don't have any multiple choice uh, engine to orchestrate interaction or things like that. Um, so here you can see it was not significant, the learning gain. Not all the learning gains were even positive. So there was al already a, a difference in the in the learning that was achieved in the two different settings, Coggle or no Coggle. Um, again, students were talking about that they haven't quite benefited from this interaction, from learning together in front of a computer together, but without anybody's guidance, that this has not worked for them. So they learned some things, but not quite everything. Um, and on the negative sort of uh, reverse uh, theme was new little, and then majority was saying that they actually didn't know much after seven sessions even. They had low self-efficacy expressed in their interview data as well and so on. And uh, finally, the trust. You can see after four sessions, the trust is probably gone down. Yeah, even after four sessions uh, of working together, um, it has at least gone down in the cognitive. They start to realize that nobody really knows anything here. Um, and the effective is probably is, is, is the same and cognitive, cognitive is this very similar because they're turning up to the same sessions together, they, they're seeing each other, but they're realizing that, oh no, not a lot of us know anything about this topic. There were some variations after seven sessions. So again, the cognitive trust didn't move, but because they have been together for seven sessions, yes, the six people are saying, out of the seven in this case, six are saying we have effective trust, six are saying, we have cognitive trust, but only two are saying we have any cognitive trust in the others. Okay, and just before the PJBL activity, that's when I say, okay, here is a, here is a task for you to do. Um, okay, I should have said PJBL here um, in the second one. It's not FC, but anyways, um, so lower trust that uh, at start just before the the, the PJBL activity. Even when you compare it to right from the very first day, it's six has become five people, four has become three, five has become four people. Cognitive trust itself uh, dropped after, which happened in, in others. Uh, uh, well, in others, I think they didn't quite specify cognitive, but it, there was general drop anyways after the activity. Um, and the, the staggering thing was uh, the autistic student, the trust was really, really down in them because people after working in unorchestrated uh, teams uh, were finding out that that this this person uh, is not really communicating very well. So maybe they're not a good teammate. So the trust kind of really goes down over a period of time for autistic students. And on the contrary, this the autistic student was the only one who had increased trust in the others. So they were like over trusting from the word go. And they just believed that the others were getting on well and teams were coming together and so on. Right. So and, and the story continues in, in, in the um, themes, in the qualitative themes. The psychological safety, which is a term used in educational teams, it, it kind of um, was showing up uh, and, and it said, um, well, the data, the themes were like five out of the six students um, uh, were, were starting to realize that, yes, it's safe now because nobody knows anything about this topic. We can open up and we can start to turn things around and maybe we can really understand this topic together. So that, that has the effect of the psychological safety has that kind of effect on teams. And uh, it was starting to happen in this team as well. But it was quite late, like on, on the fourth or the fifth session or something like that. Uh, so late development of psychological safety instead of trust was a theme in the interview as well. The, the people were saying, we don't really know that the students know the things. We know that they don't know the things. And therefore, it's safe for us to open up. There's no loss of face. There's, you know, we can, we can try and, and, and work together. 
So that's what the, the data kind of found. So I think uh, I won't go into any further of my um, results and things. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just stop at this point and let you ask the question, have a discussion about these results rather than summarizing them myself because I'm conscious of time. I've been speaking for a long time. So over to you guys, if you have questions and comments and suggestions for future work, collaborations, if, if you want, or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm open to all kind of discussion now. Thank you for listening. So Edith or Lucinda, if you are please able to, yeah. Matthew. Do you want to come in with your questions? Yes, hello. I have a question. It's Matt from Southampton University. I really enjoyed that, Manish. Uh, amazing set of work and really interesting and positive results. My question or feedback is going to seem very, very small in comparison to uh, what you shared, but I noticed in your demonstration of um, Kogel that um, you had the animations of the uh, like applause or thumbs up icons yes. and that kind of thing and that uh, I know that in some cases um, yeah, it's, it's good to have an option to be able to turn those off for some people particularly if you have a vestibular issue or um, certain uh, neuro untypical um, attributes um, mm -hmm. I wondered, I just wanted to check whether you had like included that as an option or otherwise it might be a, mm -hmm. a suggestion for mm -hmm. further development. Sure, sure. No, I haven't actually uh, thought about that on, and it didn't come up in the, in the data either. And I could, all I could remember seeing when this, these animations were being played, sort of students were, were enjoying and jubilating and saying, hey, we got it, we got it. And they were replicating that the thumbs up as well. So I no, I didn't uh, hear or, or read anything uh, which was uh, which had affected any of the students. But yes, I think I uh, since I've done this study, I've made a list of things which I think should be optional and turn we can turn on and off because yes, they, they, they may be features which um, are actually not as inclusive as I want it to be. So, you know, options are usually good. So in that sense, but yeah, thank you for your, for your input and then I'll take that forward. Thank you. I'll post in a link uh, with a technique. You probably already know about it. I'll just, I'll put in a link for something you can have a look at if you're interested, but I really enjoyed that. Thank you. I don't have any other questions other than, um, would you be sharing your slides at any point in case I wanted to yes, um, yes. point colleagues at it, especially if the recording becomes available and uh, like say, I saw a brilliant presentation for Man Manesh. These are the slides. And if you want to actually find out about it and watch the recording, if the recording will be shared later, then just makes it easy to tempt my colleagues to to have a look at this as well. So just can I ask Matthew, so what is your role at Southampton? Uh, I'm a senior learning designer in the uh -huh. digital learning team. So I'm, I'm not an okay. actual teacher. I'm more from mm. the technical background, but we have also been interested, very interested in project based learning, problem based learning, and also that, that kind of peer feedback not so much in terms of the peer support that you're getting here which is really interesting with that psychological comfort i can't remember the term off the top of my head but that you mentioned psychological yeah. safety but i've been talking with other uh, academics in our engineering department who are quite keen because like you say particularly in engineering it, um, the the students often will come in with very high A levels, and they've been taught about from a very individual context and being focused on individuals. But in the profession, it's very rare that people work as individuals. It's all about teams. So they're very keen on on building that uh, those team working attributes, and they've been quite interested in looking at ways of of measuring um, how much of a of a good team player 
if people are mm. in the groups and to be able to show over the time so over the four years of their study how they have grown into that that's something which i just know is an a wish at the moment it's not something that we have a, as a plan to aim at fulfilling it's just in my kind of my mental backlog of interesting ideas that we should mm. take a look at so that's particularly why um your piece here was was kind of it showed uh, another aspect to that that I found very interesting. So that was a long answer to your question. No, no, it's very good. Uh, we will be releasing the, the recording. I think Lucinda wanted to come in and confirm that as well. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the new idea for all the um, special interest groups is that the recordings are all going to be scooped up by the main ALT and then released um, under their auspices. Um, with links from the blog, I think. Okay, anyone else has any further questions or comments or feedback? Much appreciated. On that note though, I will stop the recording just in case anyone has any questions that they don't particularly want recorded.